everybody to the uh, Trail Tribe. Um, this is presented by the Endurance Race Series, and we've got our featured uh, guest here today. Um, we got Jim O'Hara with the Seaside Striders Run Club. We've, yeah, got, uh, we've got Vera Stepina and Isabella Janovic with Ghost Runners, and Michelle Johnson with uh, our friends over at Fleet Feet Sports in, uh, down here in San Diego. Um, so today we are just getting ready to talk about uh, some different training styles, uh, some nutrition and, uh, different training, what you can do, strength training, and even some gear, um, that you can get into, whether it's road shoes, trail shoes, hydration packs, whatever it may be. Um, so I want to get right into it. We're going to start with, uh, with Jim. Uh, Jim, so you've been doing Seaside Striders for how long? How long have you been doing your run club and, and coaching? We've been around about 17 years here in San Diego. I've been coaching runners for a little over 25 years right now from all levels of beginner runners, trying to just trying to lose a couple of pounds and get into something healthy to sub three hour marathoners and everywhere in between. It's a pretty eclectic group of people from fast to fun and everywhere in between. Wow. And everything you, you started this in, in San Diego and been doing it here in San Diego. Now, do you, do you work with like strictly California runners or, or do you do stuff virtually as well? I work with runners all over the country. Most of my coaching, though, I believe in uh, the most successful coaching with athletes is one-on-one, on -one, a on one-to-one -on -one basis where you can connect with them in person or with a group. And I, I, that comes from years of running with groups like the Mammoth Track Club, where I, I was an athlete and ran with them for a while um, and ran with the best athletes in the world. And after a while, you realize whether you're the best athlete in the world or a beginner, everybody who wants to get better runs with their group whether it's showing up at your rest event and running with the group of your trail tribe that goes out and pushes you in a race or whether it's doing weekly workouts. If you want to get better, you run with people, but everybody has their own skill set, And so in the coaching philosophy of challenging yourself, uh, but encouraging each other, everybody gets better. Uh, the idea was, okay, we need to provide one-on-one -on -one instruction for people, but at the same time provide them an atmosphere to succeed, which is this, what we believe, which is this group setting. Wow. So my question is, and a big part of the endurance race series is we, we work with a lot of uh, beginner trail runners, right? We, we roughly see about 25 to 30% new trail runners. We, you know, they're getting into whether it be a 5k, a 10k, or even a half marathon. What, uh, what do you tell runners that maybe have started in the 5k division? And we're talking strictly of trail running here. If they've started in a 5k, and they want to bump up to a half marathon in the trail category. What, what would you tell them or what, what kind of, you know, information would you give them to, to help them out in that process? Sure. You know, I think, I think the shorter answer is you want to make a lifestyle change and that takes time. Um, there are eight, uh, eight week courses out there. You can pull down an eight week coached marathon program from runner's world or wherever else. Uh, but really running is an investment in yourself, a lifestyle and time. And I think to do well with, getting your goal and then you don't want to get to your first half marathon your first 5k and be like oh thank god i did that i'm never going back <laughs> you want to get there have it be this great experience like what's next and so to do that you want to build up successfully safely over time and investing that time in yourself is one of the most one of the most valuable investments you can make i know the other speakers here will all agree with me on that one um and so you want to take time to do it and you want to do it over the course of depending on where you're at anywhere from 15 to 20 weeks if you're really looking to build something and build a base most significant changes happen in the first 10 to 12 weeks and if you look at a lot of those programs that you start to look at 20 week programs you're talking about 12 weeks of just essentially base building and skill set building uh, from there they build into peaking models and endurance and strength work and muscular work and other aspects of it where you're fine-tuning towards a specific event in really the last eight weeks but those first 12 weeks are spent building that 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 foundation that sets you up so that the next eight weeks out into that 20 weeks you are building on something that's sturdy that you can maintain that's going to give you a, a uh oh do we lose him we lost jim all right well jim are you kicking back in all right well there it is there <laughs> Jim, we lost you for, for roughly about 30 seconds there, man. So <laughs> sorry about that. Whatever, whatever explanation you're on right in this position, that's where we lost you. So <laughs> no <laughs> worries. So I've, got, I've, so I've got some other questions for you. Um, 
So, you know, I'm, I've been talking to a lot of other runners and we're, uh, some of the big things that I've kind of heard from them is they're looking at doing uh, speed work versus what, you know, the difference training for longer distance training. Can you tell the, can you give me the like kind of example of, or what you would do as far as speed work versus training for longer runs? Like, how does that work? Sure. You know, and in fact, uh, it's on road, on the road races, marathons, half marathons, road races, five K's, 10 K's. It's, it's pretty straightforward. You get, you find a flat piece of ground and you go, I think trail, you know, with trail running, it gets more interesting. Trail running, you're talking about various types of speed work uh from and a lot of it has to do with what your what your goal race is what train you want to set up for even in the ers series you've got the coast to crest trail 10k 5k and that is a fast fast 10k so if you want to get ready to go fast than that you'd want to go to a place just like that where the the ground is really smooth it's really fast you can do some fast workouts uh and if you want if you're training for another race like the como valley 15k which is hilly it's got some ruts in it that training on that flat smooth area wouldn't help you so you'd want to be something, doing something similar to that. So it's definitely personalized, but absolutely speed work is the way to train your muscles to move quicker, to move more efficiently, to move more effectively um, within moderation. I think, I think the, the trap that most runners run into is they start running every race, every run, like it's a race rather. And if you can avoid that and you can get out there and run on comparable train when you need to run fast or when you need to push the effort, there's a number of ways to do that. The most effective, I would say, if for anyone, especially for anyone on here who's starting out, is to do hill work. I think it'll help you the most with all of your runs. Hills, as they say, are the back door to speed. And by building strength and building power, you'll build turnover. Uh, you'll get going a lot faster on those flats. And you'll get her to the top of the hill and have some energy to cook down the, down the hill as well. So lots of hill work, I think, is where anybody looking to start. Speed work starts. But as far as its, its effectiveness, it goes anywhere from there, depending on what your goal race is. Um, but absolutely... And if you're going to start speed work, again, avoid the trap of running every day as your speed work day. Make it more like once a week, maybe twice a week. If you're an experienced runner, you're running over 40, 50 miles a week. If you're 30 miles or less, you're probably looking at running speed work maybe once a week. Um, you might throw in a little bit of tempo on top of that. Tempo running, if you're not familiar with it, tempo running is running at a pace that's quicker than your normal pace, uh, vaguely put. Most runners will find out whatever distance they're going to, and they'll cut down to a specific amount of pace that is – the next increments faster. So if you were training for a half marathon, you might run your 15K or 10K pace, which is slightly shorter, but faster to get used to running that pace. And then you'd come back and you would do your, mar your half marathon at a comfortable pace because your muscles would get developed. But speed work for trail running is just as essential as it is for road. It's just a matter of making sure you are doing the correct, um, correct type of speed work and on the correct terrain. Got it. Do you, do you feel that... Um in the trail running community, do you feel that it's, it's been, a, it could be a bit like a big benefit for runners to go out and pre-run that course, you know, with road, with road running, heck you can go out and run on the road and, and kind of do that course, you know, as much as time as you can. Do you kind of see that? And do you tell your runners like, Hey, if you got a chance to go out and run that coast to crest trail, um, I totally do it. So you get an idea of what that trail looks like. I mean, do you recommend that? Absolutely. Especially if you're going to race on it, any, you know, the unknown is one of the biggest fears you hear of anywhere, right? And if you can get out in a course and you're familiar with it, you know it's going to make a lot of the anxiety come down at the start line because you know what you're in for. You know where you're going to have to push you. You know you're going to have to work. It, additionally, it's like that road trip. Think about the time you drove five hours to go skiing. You got, go in there. It feels like, oh, my gosh, I'm never going to get there. I'm never going to get there. And you drive home, and it feels like, boom, five hours went by like that because you know the terrain already coming back. Uh, it's really similar to that. If you're familiar with the terrain, because your stress level will be lower, because you'll be familiar with what, what's going on, and you can also balance out and pace yourself through the race better, you'll have a much better result. So for sure, anytime you can, you can check out a course beforehand, absolutely go for it. You know, you don't want to go do it so much you get bored of it, but definitely if you have an op op opportunity to, like we do around here on a lot of the trails in the U.S. series, hop out there once a week when the event's coming up and just get familiar with it so you can go on race day. Nice. Um, well, Jim, thanks a lot. That was great information. Um, I really appreciate it. Go ahead and uh, do me a favor and just go ahead and give us a shout out of your, either your, your website or your, or your Facebook people where people can go and check out uh, sure. some of your coaching and, and some information about what you do. Here, here it comes. This is my Facebook page or our Facebook page for the club. Uh, 
All right, so Seaside Striders Running Club, you can find us on Facebook or you can go to SeasideStridersRunningClub.com. The website is currently under, uh, like a lot of websites out there due to, due to what's going on with our health crisis and pandemic, is uh, kind of on its way to be reintroduced next week with some new information and updates on it. Uh, but definitely Seaside Striders Running Club, you can check that out. It's got all the current information on it. We're constantly updating, showing workouts that we're doing throughout the week. Right now, we're doing a lot of indoor workouts because of the landscape of the world. Um, but there's plenty of opportunity to connect with other runners there and find out about ways to improve your pace, improve your ability, just learn more about running. You know, before these guys get going, one of the best things they all offer is knowledge. Any runner out there, if you can arm yourself with knowledge, you're going to have, you're going to get more out of your runs. You're going to enjoy them more and you're going to run better. So our next, our next, uh, group that is working with us is, is ghost runners. And this is Isabella Janovic and Vera Stepina and Vera stepped away just for a quick second. Um, so Isabella, this is all on you actually. So <laughs> no pressure, <laughs> no pressure at all. No pressure at all. Uh, Vera's back. So we're good to go. Um, so go ahead and, um, tell everybody about ghost runners, what you guys offer as far as your services, where you guys are located at, who you work with, um, all of that. And then we'll get into it. So Ghost Runners was founded by Vera Stepina and myself, and we primarily help San Diego runners, but we also help um, kind of like Jim virtually nationwide. Um, and we promote a lot of strength training for runners and nutrition for runners. So we're not talking about fad diets or cleanses or drinks. We're talking real nutrition. What do you eat while you're training? What do you eat the day before a race, the morning of a race, during a race, after a race for optimal recovery? Um, Vera, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I wanted to add um, that we implement a lot of uh, strength training, and I don't like to call it cross training because I believe strength training should be a part of anybody's running plan. And by strength training, we don't mean we don't mean like lifting heavy weights or you know getting killing yourself at the gym like five days a week, but uh, simple uh, resistance training that your body will benefit from. So you can be stronger when you run and also prevent any injuries. We've all, you know, rolled our ankles and had like a freak injury here and there. So if there's something we can do to avoid that and um, basically prevent injuries and recover faster, this is what we implement strength training for. Very cool. So let's, let's stay on the strength training aspect here since we're talking about it. And I want to get to nutrition after that. Um, so as a, as a runner, how often should 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 a runner um, be doing strength training? And add in a secondary question as a follow up question for that, is strength training would you consider like a heavy lift type of strength training or something that just gets your muscles um, going and, and a little bit stronger? Like break down that for me uh, so we have an understanding. So it really just depends on everybody's goals. Everybody's individual goals are different. And somebody who's training for their first 5K on the road definitely is going to have a different plan than somebody who's training for, I don't know, 50 miler on the trails. And the strength exercises are going to be different. The frequency is going to be different. And the exercises themselves are going to be different. For somebody who's just beginning, and if we're talking strictly about a sort of uh, like a shorter distance up to a half marathon on the trail, um, I would recommend something implementing two to three times a week. Um, a lot of body weight exercises is plenty. You don't have to lift heavy, like I said, uh, but a lot of functional movements, full body compound movements, such as squats and push ups and pull ups and lunges and uh, some power moves like jumps um, and calisthenics for the most part. 30 minutes, three times a week. Usually that's enough for somebody who is from a beginner to kind of like an average runner and if we're talking about olympic athletes that's a whole different category of people and uh i don't think we're gonna be touching those at all <laughs> another thing that people forget is how important your core and upper body strength is um, some people think oh i only have to do squats or lunges for my legs to strengthen my legs no you need to make sure everything is strengthened um you're running you know jim might answer this better, but your running form, you're using your entire body, you know, you're not just using your legs. So um, we always have a pr promote our clients and to do an upper body and core work as well. Yeah. And then you carry a pack on your back, like when you go into a longer distance and that gets tiring really, really fast. So a lot of times for people who are new and they run 
a longer distance trail and they find that the next day their upper body is so sore like more sore than their legs because we carry a lot of stuff on our back and you need to make sure that's all supported and also when you know your upper body gets tired it your body starts to compensate with other muscles group muscle groups so you start to become more weak as you go so so speak to so speak to the the weighted situation here for just a second um you know a, a lot of athletes are now starting to wear like weight vests so give me a like so when you're carrying something on your back versus a weight vest uh, is there a, is there a separation between that is there a, what's the difference between having you know some extra weight on the front and back versus is it better just to have some weight on the back explain that for me just a little bit Is you want to explain that? Yeah, I think it's definitely a matter of preference. Um, What's nice about all these packs coming out is the technology is getting better and better. And um, I'm sure Michelle can touch more on this, the packs, but it's really the preference on how you want to get to things. And whatever you decide to do, you make sure you train with it before race day. So it doesn't really matter if it's in the front or the back or the back only. And that's what's nice about the variety. What I'm, what I'm, I'm sorry if I misspoke. What I'm talking about is weighted vests. Right. That's not, not so much the hydration. You mean training aspect. with a weighted yeah, vest? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh not, okay. Not so the hydration <laughs> aspect of it. That's fine. Not so okay. much the hydration <laughs> aspect of it, but uh, a weighted pack. A weighted vest. Yeah. A weighted vest, whether it's a weighted vest that carries your weight on front and back or something that just carries on, on your back. What, from that perspective, can you break that down as far as the training aspect? On the that? biggest tip I have for a weighted vest, don't ever, ever run with it. It's okay to hike with one, but don't ever run with it because when you fall, that's an extra 20, 50 pounds going down with you and you will sprain or break an ankle. I'm telling you, no running with a weight vest, only hiking, do it all day long. <laughs> you can only do it for a video, not, not, not like, not, not like for real training. Now, if, yeah. if, no. somebody, if somebody wants to train with a weight vest, um, how, how often would, would, would you want to train with a weight vest when you're out hiking or taking videos for <laughs> short <laughs> or whatever it is. <laughs> I would say like, if you are doing that for training, then go ahead and take your pack that you're going to be running the race with and pack it with whatever supplies you're going to take with you and just train with that. If you're training for a different kind of event, like if you're training for a Spartan race and you know, you're going to be carrying heavy things again, like it's a completely different way of training. So you can do that a couple of days a week, but again, you hike with it and you want to go longer distance you want to go uphill um but you shouldn't be running with it but like i said i i think the best idea is just to train how you're going to be running your race got it does that answer your question or no it totally totally does and it's (laughs) i'm i'm i I love being able to train with the wave vest myself personally so i i always always talk to people about the different you know because you see people you know, all different types of weight vests, especially now, you know, people are, don't have, have, have a chance to go to the gym. So you'd see them out, out and about in their neighborhoods, you know, with all different types of some kind of weighted vest on or weight on their back, you know, whether it's a sandbag they're car- covering, carrying or whatever it is. So I always kind of like to hear, you know, what the thoughts are as far as the training aspect of, of actually doing that. But um, the next thing I'm kind of curious about is from, and Vera, I know you, you own a gym. And, um, so I kind of want to hear from you what, um, some of the best, uh, training exercises are for your runners, um, that you do, what what do you, what do you do with your runners? So, um, what I do with my runners, uh, we do focus a lot on core work and by core work, I don't mean ab exercises. I mean, full body core work, which a lot of it implements, uh, single legged exercises, um, like single legged deadlifts or bent overs that have to be with weight. Weights are great too. And uh, um, regular squats, jump squats, jump lunges. Uh, we do box jumps. We do a lot of agility exercises. I use penalty boxes, hence the name. They're not fun. Uh, <laughs> but it's all about accuracy and how correctly you can place your feet in certain um, squares. Um, so that's how we work on speed and agility as well. We do sprints. We do um, 100 meters, and then we kind of like uh, balance them out with exercise in between. 
but again, we do a lot of upper body work, which a lot of times is just push-ups and pull-ups and simple exercises that you can be doing at the gym or at home. So it's not necessarily that you have to have a gym to go to. Um, it doesn't have to be hard. Like it doesn't have to be complicated. The simpler, the better. That's yeah. kind of like my approach. And so from a, you know, obviously with, with any kind of training comes mobility, right? Absolutely, and so yes. to kind of speak on, on, um, on the mobility side of things for a little bit, like how often, you know, should somebody, you know, be working on their mobility as long as well as working on their strength? I mean, is this like, are you looking at an everyday thing? Um, are you looking at you know, two or three times a week? What, what's, what's your recommendation as far as, um, that, I mean, when you're out there trail running, right. The, one of the biggest things is, is agility, mobility, and, you know, worrying about tripping on the trails or whatever it is. So how much of the mobility aspects will help out um, with somebody who's out there on the trails running? It helps out a lot. Uh, I always look at the problem from different aspects and all of the, as, as many variables we can control that goes into the plan, the better the outcome is going to be, right? So mobility is a big part of it. So let's say like the whole running aspect would be like 60% of your training plus strength training, nutrition, mobility, recovery, uh, stretching, uh, preventive measuring, like your, your sleep routine is like super important as well. So mobility probably stands for about 15% of that outcome as well. So I would normally recommend about um, 30 to 40 minutes of mobility twice per week. But if you know that you have an ongoing issue, like you know you roll that ankle twice a year, clearly something is wrong with there. So I would definitely go get it assessed by a physical therapist and follow the exercises. And I would implement that into your training every single day for, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes to kind of just keep working on that. Do you feel that? Another thing is um, people need to continue to do mobility even when they feel good. So right. people tend to only do mobility when they hurt themselves. And as soon as they feel better, they stop. They need to con consistently do it, even if it's just once a week and when you're right. feeling good. Um, upper body versus, uh, lower body mobility. How, how important is upper body, upper body mobility to your, your trail running? It's pretty important as well. I think you're running on a trail, you trip and you fall. You definitely want to be able to control that with your upper body. You don't want to break your arm just because you have no mobility in your shoulder. So that's pretty important too. Everything in your body is important. People say, you know, 80%, 20%. I say it's 100% of everything, and then you're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's, let's uh, shift gears here a little bit and talk um, nutrition. All right. Um, what are, you know, with, you know, the, the big thing that I've seen virtually nowadays is, we, you know, over the last you know, couple of weeks, I've seen a lot of backyard ultras. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people doing virtual virtual runs here, whether it's a long distance run, a short distance, whatever it may be. Um, what should, what are the, what are the key nutritional aspects of preparing before you go out and run? Let's say you're going out for one of these backyard ultras or even a backyard marathon. What, what should somebody be looking at as far as what do they eat the day, you know, the day before, maybe the morning of maybe in between or during an event. Um, I think that, obviously is a huge part in how, how well people are going to, you know, go and do their race, you know, day in, day out. I like that you call it an, an event. <laughs> a backyard well, I event. mean, it is. I mean, that's the thing, it, right? It is. Yeah. I mean, it totally is. In, in today's normal, you know, weird times, I mean, the, a, a backyard ultra is just as much an event, you know, yeah. in your own. Hey, I ran one. So yeah. Right? Yeah, I did one. You know, so, <laughs> It's an event, man. It's, it's, it's brutal just in its own right. So, but uh, yeah. I think I, the biggest thing, biggest thing is that you got to treat it just like in any other event that you're going to do because it's still the same distance. Conditions are probably going to be worse than they would be at the race. Uh, like we ran 50K out on the streets and it's not as pleasant as being outside of the mountains and <laughs> on the trails where people cheer you on and like nobody really cheers you on on Old Norte Parkway. So uh, just treat it the same, uh, make like a lot of people during quarantine, they kind of forgot about all of their 
nutritional, um, I don't know, guidelines. I don't, I don't know how to say it. Like not necessarily diet, but people are like, ah, oh, you know, I'm stuck at home. So I'm just going to eat whatever quarantine 15 and everything. Um, but getting into any event, you know, that if you gain any extra five pounds, you know, it's going to be harder to be out there running. Every five pounds matter. Every calories life matters for the sake of uh, nutrition. But you want to treat it the same as like you would do a race day. <clears throat> so a few days before, um, as Isabella and I, we normally don't recommend doing any carb loading the day before. We recommend that you eat um, the same food that you normally eat and like not like you normally eat during quarantine, like what you normally eat during normal times. Stick to foods that you know your stomach digest uh, correctly. Uh, avoid spicy, avoid dairy, um, avoid, like if you know something doesn't go well in your stomach, it's probably best not to eat that. Uh, you can go a little bit higher on carb um, two days and one day prior to the race day, uh, but not the day before because you don't want to feel heavy and you don't want to risk any bathroom stops when you're on El Norte Parkway again. <laughs> um, and we also recommend adding a little bit of salt into your water a couple of days before your event as well. Then he actually asked the question about um, how to avoid cramps. I didn't finish reading the whole question, but he asked something about the cramps. So adding a little bit of salt two days and one day before the race actually will most likely help you with preventing the cramps as well. My number one biggest tip for beginner runners or any runners on race day, do not try anything new, all right? I'm going to repeat that. Do not try <laughs> anything new on race day. I don't care what you read the night before, what your friends are eating. Stick to what you know and what your body knows. Otherwise, you yes. will regret it later. Absolutely. And for those who are doing the longer distances, you need to eat during your race. So you got to train while eating and running so that when you come to the half marathon, the 25K, the 50K, you're already used to eating and consuming calories during your race. So Vera, I want to I want to step back just for a second on the carb situation because um, the for the longest time um, you know you go to a lot of these a lot of these events and the night before if you're at an expo everybody's talking about oh, I need to go out and gonna get a pasta dinner you know eat some car eat, eat carb load up you know the night before so is that that's not a thing anymore like that's not the recommendation. Uh, for not people necessarily that... true. It's not necessarily accurate. Uh, your body is going to use glycogen that it has in it, like in the body, and it's going to use the glycogen that it already accumulated a few days prior, not necessarily just the day before. But the fact that you went really high on your carbs the night before, like I said, um, I'm going to go a little bit in a, into a poop aspect here. Right, um, because I mean, we've all like it's a, it's a running thing, you know. Like you wanna you wanna do your best right. and avoid accidents and whatnot. Uh, but the more you eat, the more your body is going to have to digest, and the more it's gonna have to come out. So the more like if you eat a lot of pasta with marinara sauce the day before and meatballs, it's just you're gonna have more poop. So you kind of wanna avoid that. And like I said, there is plenty of glycogen in our body that is stored on Friday and Thursday and Wednesday, and your body will go into those sources and look at us. We don't look like we are depleted here of any kind of fuel sources. So um, for the most part, it's just, it's, it's a mental thing for a lot of people. Like, oh, I didn't carb load yesterday, so I feel like I don't have enough energy. If you train correctly, you will have energy and your body will use the glycogen that it has. And I would avoid alcohol for the whole week before a race, not just the day before. Ooh. I would avoid it the whole week and just hydrate with water the whole week. I mean, come on, that could really? be a cramping problem as well, Danny. That could be your cramping problem. That Those couple of beers you're having the night before your race, you're dehydrating your muscles, you know? There's plenty of beer to drink after the race. Jeff already always has it at the finish line, so. Yeah. Um, but then, so again, what I wanted to bring up, like, this little thing – when we go into racing and uh, it, we, everybody treats it differently. Everybody has different goals, right? Like Jeff, you know, at your races, you're always going to have your top five and they're going to be present in every race and they're going to be running hard. They're going to be pushing harder. So obviously their nutrition and the way they treat the pre-race um, routine is different, you know? So uh, 
kind of like Jim, Isabella and I, the way we train our athletes is we don't train them just to finish. We want them to finish the race and be happy at the end and say, I killed it and I will do it again, you know? So if this is how you want to finish your race, you want to avoid alcohol for a whole week before and you want to make sure you eat correctly and you take care of yourself, you go to bed on time and you recover your mobility and stretching. Uh, for somebody who is just doing like a neighborhood 5K for fun and, you know, then I guess it's kind of just different approach for everybody. So, but if you want to do it right, you want to avoid that. Well, I, I also think this, this time here where it's hot, that's a, there, that's a part of the hydration equation is managing that alcohol consumption, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, so it is, I want to go back to uh, something you, you just mentioned. You mentioned um, eating during, during an event, mm -hmm. right? Um, obviously, you, you want to drink your electrolytes or water you know, during, your, during your race, whatever that race may be, whether it's a physical or virtual uh, situation. But go into the uh, breakdown a little bit more of the eating during an event. Um, like how, like how much should somebody be eating? If you're doing an, if you're doing an ultra versus a, you know, maybe a half marathon, right? Like a, what, what are you eating during, mm -hmm. during the event? How much should you be eating during that? And, and I know this is going to depend on everybody's different, but how often should you be eating? Something? So yeah, everyone's different. And it also depends on what you've um, trained with. So a half marathon, um, you may only need to one quick little snack, depending how fast you're running. Um, sometimes it's something as simple as one of those waffle stingers at your aid station. Some people can't handle those. So they bring their own little fruit or um, they make some sort of anything rice balls at home. Um, a 50 K you're going to eat more substantial food because you need a lot more calories. However, you're also drinking a lot more electrolytes, which have calories as well. So it just depends on how much, um, I like to tell people to nibble every 45 minutes. So, Hey, if you're running a half marathon in, you know, an hour and the half hour and 20 minutes and you're super speedster, you may only need like a bite or two and some electrolyte and you're good. But if your fit's taking you two and a half to three hours because you're new to trails and you're going to want to make sure you eat some calories so that you don't hit that wall later. And for those people who are new to trail running and they might say, oh, I don't even eat during a marathon road race. Trails are different guys. They're completely different. You got to train with, uh, with eating and calories. And it's more fun that way. More, I know the aid stations have the best food, especially ultras. <laughs> it's like a full buffet. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, let, let's speak on that just for this, for just a second. Is like when you're at an ultra, right? I mean, you've got you know some ultras will offer sandwiches or burgers mm -hmm. or what? Like, is there anything in particular that you should you should gear your nutrition towards during an event? Right. You, you want it again. You don't want to eat anything new. So whatever snacks you've been trained with, that's what you want to eat on the race day. A lot of race directors, you can email them ahead of time and ask them what kind of electrolyte they'll be serving and what kind of foods that they'll have at the aid station. If you don't like the foods they're serving, you're, you can always put your own snacks in your drop bags. I try to stay away from the sugars, um, have natural sugars like the fruit or dried fruit instead of going for the Oreos and the M&Ms. Um, and I try to tell people to avoid uh, greasy foods. So hamburgers and pizza, I would skip those. Vera, you and might some, have some, something to add to that. Some people, some people just, you know, do a lot better with those foods than others. Um, um, as much as I like to have a quesadilla, I would not eat it at the aid station because I know I'm going to have some side effects later that I would prefer to not deal with um, on an ultra race. Like I know I'm going to be running for 12 hours. So I'm going to try and stick to single ingredient foods. And I, a lot of times would bring my own too, which, um, rice balls. I make rice balls a lot. I would stick to bananas, um, uh, dried fruit. I use a couple of, um, I use a couple of, um, energy gels. I use spring energy. I use new energy just for the sake of simplicity of what goes in there. I'm pretty good with, um, single waffles. I can't take the gels, but it, it, it's just, you live and learn. You kind of have to learn it by experience and you're probably going to have a couple of bad experiences before you learn what works for you. But that's why we recommend train with food. So try everything before you go into the race. So that way, you know, for sure. Do you guys have a recommendation on, um, 
you know, electrolyte drinks, you know, like obviously something like Gatorade is going to be super sweet. Right. Now, yeah. is there any, is there any electrolytes, you know, drinks that you know, work for you or have worked for you? And you know, what would, what would you be recommendation be for those? I like, um, I use Scratch and I use Tailwind. Both of them work well for me. I have to dilute them a little bit more because they're on the sweeter side. For the convenience factor, I use Spring Energy because they're pre-packed in a little packages and they're liquid. So um, they just, you know, dissolve in water super quick and they're not sweet. Um, I know most races actually will serve Tailwind. So it's convenient because, you know, like I've tried them before. I know they would work for me, but I would still bring my own. Never try new electrolytes on a race day. Never. And what works from one person may not work for another. Right. So again, train with the electrolyte. And another reason to keep your own electrolyte in your drop bag is some of the volunteers won't mix it right at the aid stations. Mm -hmm. So like, oh, they didn't put Volunteers get that there. stuff right all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's nice all the time. Yes. <laughs> so it's always nice to have your own little stash. Very true. Well, thanks a lot, guys. I really appreciate that. That was super helpful. Um, and if anybody's got any questions, feel free to write them in now um, or even just shout out. Um, but while we're doing that, go ahead and um, go okay. uh, online, website, social media. What do you guys got for us? I think Jim's got a question. I have a oh. question for you guys. It, it, Vera started to touch on it, um, and I want to just sort of circle back to it. One of the things I hear from my runner and I, runners, and I think all the runners on here will – kind of had me wondering about this question is I always hear runners tell me that they don't want to eat in a race because they're out there to burn calories or they're, they're out there to exercise. They don't want to do it. And I always return with a response of uh, carbohydrates burn in the furnace or fats burn in the furnace of carbohydrate. And I'd, I'd love to hear with your nutritional background, your take on that. So um, again, it's, there are a lot of opinions on this particular topic. And uh, there is a whole category of people that train uh, without food because they go into the fat sources and they burn calories from the fat source. Uh, from my experience and from my research, um, I believe that we do go into the glycogen to burn calories first. And it's the most efficient way to sustain your energy, especially during the long endurance run. Like if I go for... Um, um, I actually do intermittent fasting pretty often. Like I don't eat until 11 a.m. like on a daily basis. Like I work out fasted, you know, that works fine for me. I can go, I, like I've, I can go run 10 miles on empty stomach and be okay without snacks or anything. But if I know I'm going to be out there for 12 hours before and during, and I would make sure that I have efficient sources of food before as well. Does that help? No, definitely. It, it's always that, that challenge of explaining to people that the, the calories that you're burning while you're running aren't necessarily what you're consuming, but that what you're consuming Correctly. is helping you burn, those, burn, and, burn and be efficient with the energy sources you're using. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. You're like fueling said, your body. Yeah, you are. Yeah. And a lot of times it's for the sake of just feeling better, like mentally too, you know, like when you feel hungry, like you don't want to do anything when we all know hunger is not an emergency. We can all survive, but um, it's fifty percent of that is mental. So you want to be strong mentally as long as as well as physically. Um, so yeah. Perfect. Well, thanks a lot, guys. Jim, great question. Um, is if you guys could uh, put up your information in the chat section, um, that way we can either website or again social media, so people can go and check you guys out. They haven't. Uh, yep. Yep. It'd be great. And so I want to move on to, chat. I want to move into gear and we've got uh, Michelle Johnson again with Fleet Feet. Uh, thank you for joining us. And Michelle, you and I kind of pinpointed two different things. We're going to talk about shoes and we're going to talk about hydration packs. Here today. So I kind of want to start with the, tr with the shoe aspect of it first. Um, go ahead and explain that the big difference is, 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 Give me the difference between trail and road shoes first. Sure. And I brought us some uh, shoes to look at here. Ooh, show and tell. <laughs> yeah. Um, so main difference is going to be uh, your trail shoes going, most trail shoes have a rock plate, which protects the bottom of your foot when you're on a rougher terrain. Um, these lugs on the bottom, 
um, for gripping and 